Hi, I'm Mark Baber. I'm the technical marketing manager here in the UK and Ireland for Sony's Photo Channel. Now, welcome to this pre-recorded live webinar with myself interviewing John Edwards, DOP of Naive Studios. Now, we're going to be talking to John about career advice of getting into filmmaking, or if you're a student in filmmaking, some industry advice and tips of getting the best out of what you're doing. Now, before we go live to John, let's have a closer look at his work. We're going to show you a reel and then go live to John and talk to him about career advice in filmmaking. So let's go live now to John Edwards and say hi, John. How are you, John? Good to see you. Hi, Mark. Yeah, thank you very much. Um, yeah, I'm good, thank you. Thanks for joining us with the WEX B2B webinar today. We're going to be talking to you about career advice in filmmaking. Uh, and just to remind the audience that this is a pre-recorded webinar that will be uh, live and embedded into the WEX channels uh, once this has been uh, premiered, I think, on YouTube. So, um, John, let's kick this straight off. Let's talk about your career, how you got into filmmaking. Let's go right back to the educational side where you know, you discovered it so that um, it gives our audience a, an idea of, you know, what's it like to, to be where you are now and, and, and where you've come from. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So um, I suppose, obviously, not, not so much with high school and GCSEs and stuff. I, I did art classes and enjoyed them. Um, but then after that, I went on to college and um, I chose um, fine art, I guess it was really. It was, it was an art class. I did design technology and I did IT, strangely, at the time. Felt like I just needed to, didn't really enjoy that. And um, yeah, so from there, I kind of did fine art. I kind of knew it wasn't what I wanted to be doing because I was doing a lot of painting, a lot of drawing, and the teacher was very kind of structured with that side of stuff. Um, and then I started to look at either university uh, with doing A-levels, and um, oh, I took on photography as well as uh, in the second year, which was really good, actually. I really enjoyed that. And I think that, again, kind of made me realise I might want to do some film but I bought just like a, a, a cheap uh, digital camera at the time. And then, um, yeah, from there, my parents were trying to push me into some kind of steady job already. Um, my father's an engineer, so, you know, it was all kind of, I completely get it, but they looked at stuff from that side of things, you know, like pension, paid every Friday, you know, what are you doing with art? He, he's really good at drawing as well, so, you know, it's hard to justify um, how I was ever going to do anything with it. So, um they actually got me, uh, I went to Airbus, which is like a big um, plane company, and I, I went and had an interview for designing plane wings, but um, I completely messed it up because I had no real interest in it at the time, and I, I just didn't know what I wanted to do. So um, I managed to talk them into letting me do a foundation course at college, and that was really good. Like That was a massive help to me, but it gave me just an extra year and more time to discover other things in the creative sector, I suppose. So um, I then started doing graphic design, which was great. Because I'd kind of seen, I went straight into A levels, and then I saw when I got to college there was things like B text, and I just never really had that information. So I was always jealous of the guys that were like on the graphics course and talked to them a little bit, and I was just kind of doing paintings and life drawing and stuff, you know. And I was thinking, how oh, am I going to make any money out doing this? Or you know, please my parents. So um, so I did the art foundation here, and that was really good. Started doing graphics. There wasn't any tutors on the course that were like into graphics really which was awkward for me so like to get work reviewed and critiqued and stuff was was a bit of a hassle and then again universities and that kind of guidance wasn't the easiest I had to kind of go route into friends and I was kind of starting to get so interested in it I was talking to people who were working in it and stuff um, so I went and had a visit to Manchester Met 
and uh, Liverpool, I think John Moores and a couple of others, they're all kind of close to home in the northwest. I wasn't really going to move from a bit of a humble, if I'm honest. So, um, yeah, and then I got an unconditional offer at Man Met, which is great. So um, I kind of knew it was all set then, really. So I finished the course. Um, I had that summer off and then um, the off to Manchester. And, and that was really good because I chose, I didn't actually do graphic design. I did design and art direction. And I thought that was a good move as well because it opened up more areas rather than just purely graphics. So um, we did some photography. We started doing some filmmaking. Um, and that was really good with the filmmaking side of stuff. I think that's why I kind of got more into it and a little bit more excited by that. Um, obviously a lot of graphics work and print work as well, which is kind of cool. Um, yeah, and then at, at uni I made a little, uh, I've always wrote BMX for like years and years and years. So I made a BMX DVD as part of my final project. Um, I made like a little magazine. And around the same time I started writing music reviews and uh, reports for a BMX magazine, uh, Dig. Uh, which I'd read for years, so that was kind of, to me, it was kind of cool being involved with that. And I've kind of worked alongside the photographer a little bit, and kind of had a bit of an insight, you know, to what was going on and how, how that worked. So, um, yeah, from there I started doing some graphics for them and some illustration for, like, the interview pieces and stuff. Uh, nothing video-wise. And then um, uni finished, and obviously I had to get a real job, as my parents would say. So I, I ended up, I took a job in Liverpool as an art worker, and at the time, stupidly, I didn't know what an art working position was. So I went along to this interview at this big fancy agency and um, kind of on the spot uh, went through understanding what an art worker did compared to a graphic designer and just kind of agreeing with them and going along with it to, to get the role. And I, I yeah, at the time, because it was like a senior art worker there rather than a graphic designer. And I was just sat there thinking, well, don't want to design the projects rather than just set them up for print, but obviously not. So, so I, I got that, and within a week of having it, I got offered another job in Chester, closer to home, which was just a really small print house. And I took that just because the commute was less, and I'd, I'd just finished and stuff. So, and it was really boring. So I just, I did like, it was like, uh, you know, it was basically a print house, and I set stuff up for print. Really, it did some design work, but very little, like brochures and like menus for restaurants and stuff. And, it was, it was really good. I learned so much on the spot, you know, because I'd, I'd finished the course and I hadn't really taken in stuff like InDesign. So, um, so yeah, I really learned on my feet with that. And that, that was interesting you know, to actually be in the working world, I suppose, in the creative sector and how fast things moved and people needed stuff. So, um, yeah, I did that for a year. And then I moved to a timber company doing graphics again. And um, I started doing more video stuff on the side then, I think, really. I bought a newer camera. And the technology was getting a bit better. I think that was probably when I got my first like um, DSLR, really. You know, when that kind of that boom kind of happened, and um, you know, you're actually like, wow, this looks like an actual photograph or a movie all of a sudden, and I can change lenses, and you know, um, the shutter speed can go high enough and stuff. So, so um, yeah, I got a DSLR, and then I started messing around with that whilst I was working full time. And then um, I moved from the timber company because uh, we had the recession, and the timber company took. A downturn so the correct team went and I moved to the NHS and I was doing medical photography and uh, some video work in theatre and um, of different procedures and stuff if anything was specialist it was an orthopedic hospital and uh, graphic design again on their website and then from that I think the the two guys I worked with were great and they were like you know purist photographers they'd shot and filmed for years and um, they just they, they taught me a lot really from that angle and then obviously we're doing the action sport kind of stuff as a personal it was kind of a nice combination of one was like really modern and how skateboarding was shot and bikes and stuff and then the other was kind of you know this purest black and white photography medical photography very structured you know very calculated so so it was good to kind of understand the roots of everything go back to doing some stuff with dark room and then um yeah i I put a video into a Sony competition, Sony Pro Production Awards at the time it was, and um, I honestly didn't think it would get anywhere. It was just I was getting more interested in it, and I just wanted something critique, really. Um, so I put it in, and it just kept going through. It went through like the first round, it went to the second round, and I was like, this is bizarre. Um, and then, yeah, it, it got to the final, and then it, and, it, and it won. So it won like the that was the commercial sector because it was for a skate park video. It was like a little promo ad for a new skate park in our local area. And um, 
yeah, so Sony were then amazing, and I got an FS700 camera, the, the original, like, probably prosumer, I suppose, like, like the lower Cine line, um, ultra slow motion camera. And then off that, they set me a brief of uh, shooting a uh, slow motion reel for the camera to play at IBC. So I spent the rest of the summer then shooting this reel, which was really nice because I had no one kind of in charge of me. I just, you know, I'd, I'd come up with some ideas that I thought were cool for slow motion and I'd go and document them. So I went and shot some car racing. I went and shot a Pro BMX tour in Spain. Uh, just some other stuff that I was doing anyway, really. It was, you know, it was all kind of hobby based and interest. So, so it was cool. And the visuals were great because I had the time to set them up. You know, there was no client. There was no, and um, I sent it back to Sony. I don't know if they were expecting much, really. But, but yeah, they were, they were bowled over with it. And then they offered me some more training. So I, I went down to Pinewood in London to their, uh, it's the DMPC, isn't it? The Digital Media Picture Center. And um, they gave me training on like color grading and editing and lighting scenes. So um, that's really good. And I took my work down and was like, oh, you know, can you critique some of this stuff? Because I'm just learning stuff online. You know, I'm not really talking to anyone directly. So, so I had guidance there and that was really nice. So, yeah. So, so that was kind of it then. And then that was kind of when I realized, oh, I want to do this full time now. You know, I'm kind of, I've done 10 years of graphics and I'd kind of topped out my position where I was. I was like a senior and I had a boss who was only a couple of years younger than me. So I was like, well, I'm never going to be the boss. So, um, you know, I, I might go and do my own thing. So um, I got a couple of retainer clients. And then off that, I, um, yeah, I, I just jumped ship in the end. I tried to go part-time because I thought that would be more sensible for me uh, to, to keep a regular income because by then, you know, I'd, I'd turned 30 already. And I was earning all right money in the in the job I was in. I had a pension and everything, so it was a bit late, really, to kind of do something. I wouldn't say foolish, uh, daring, I suppose, like it's radical, a big change. Yeah, yeah. I know my parents pulled their hair out. You know, how long are you going to do this for? You're going to be back <laughs> in the other job, and so on and so on. But they, you know, they don't. They just don't understand how the world's changed and appetite has changed, and so on and so on. So. Um, so I got a retainer on purpose just to cover that to prove them wrong that it wasn't going to take a downturn all of a sudden, and and that was good. That covered probably I know we we mentioned Mark talking about wages and stuff, so that that covered probably three quarters of my wage at the hospital, and that was good because I was uh, I had a reasonable job at the hospital with it. It was graphics but because I was doing medical photography. I think there's ten bands in the NHS, and I was on a six, so I, I was earning pretty good money, you know, like managerial almost kind of money. So it was awkward, you know, to sidestep anyway, you know, to do that. So anyway, this company, I started working with them from scratch and luckily they kind of blew up as a fashion brand. Uh, the Couture Club, it's called, it's all kind of run by influencers, Manchester-based company. Um, we just found each other completely by chance. I was doing a watch brand and then uh, one of the guys that co-owned the watch brand started the clothing brand because he'd been on TV on one of those like Love Island programs or something. Uh, but Ross is a really nice guy and then he spun me some work and um, yeah, we just went on loads of trips with them. It was good because I guess from that side of things with influencers, they understand the worth of media and social media, you know, and how they were building at the time, because this was probably five or, five or six years ago now, maybe. Well, maybe five years ago, I think. And um, yeah, so he gave me a retainer. Um, it was like just over 20 grand or something. And, and that sorted me out really, because I was like, well, you know, I'm only doing, I think it was allocated to three, three days a week or one shoot a month for them or something. So I had plenty of time to do other stuff, which was great. So I could kind of bulk out my wage. And then it just went from there, really. They, they, the next thing I suppose that was really good is they got bought, well, not bought out, but their percent shoulder was JD Sports. And then JD Sports started turning up at the shoots because they really liked the creative side of stuff and wondering what was going on with it. And it was literally me and uh, my friend Jacob. He was doing all the photography. Uh, and that was it. We had no runners, no assistants. We're dragging everything around. Um, they were taking us all over the place, like LA, um, Spain, Portugal, like crazy. They were spending mad amounts of money on trips because uh, they, they, it just kept growing. And I think they wanted to show that they were doing well, you know, so they were pumping loads of money into these campaigns and no one knew what they were doing. <laughs> there was no production team involved. It was just two guys that worked together and then the clothing brand itself. Um, but yeah, just, it just kept working. So yeah, JD turned up and, and saw what was going on and realized they could cut corners. And um, so, yeah, it took a bit of chasing. So we had the meeting with JD on one of the sets. 
swap numbers, couldn't get in contact with anyone. They were kind of too high up. The guy who'd come out to see us, he was like on the board or something. And then bizarrely, we were shooting a new clothing launch in Manchester for, Jay, uh, for, for Couture Club. And that guy turned up just to have some drinks and hang out and see what was going on. And so cheekily, I just went out to chat with him and said, oh, you know, do you remember? Because it, it rolled back four months then. And said, you know, can we do something? What can we do? I can't get in touch with you. And he was really nice. And like the next week, uh, I spoke to him. And then the week after that, I think about two weeks after that event, we were going to Miami to shoot a main campaign for JD, which was just mental to us. We needed, they wanted a drone operator and uh, the production like location was right next to the airport. So to get like the rights and passes to do that, I had to fly a friend in luckily who's got a drone license in LA over to Miami to shoot the drone stuff. And we only needed like five or six clips. It was crazy, but they, they weren't bothered. They just spent the money on it. But it was just, yeah, it went from really small to like really big in that first year on, on production side of things. And we had a production team in from London with catering, bands and stuff. Um, it was just a massive learning curve, but really fun. In time, time scale wise then, from yeah. education to, to working, to get in that break, how how long? You said you were thirty when you were at the NHS and kind of made that change jump. in in career. Um, yeah, yeah. Or jump. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah. Yeah. So, how long how long was that period of time to to, to where you kind of got that break? Yeah. So I'd say I came out of uni and I never had any downtime. You know, I didn't I didn't go on a year's travel or anything. I wanted to, but the parents just kind of forced me to do work. So. Um, so I'd say I did graphics for like pretty much 10 years straight out of uni, really. And then um, from there, um, I'd say, yeah, from the NHS and, and deciding I wanted to do more video work, what I'd learned at the NHS. I was there about six years in the NHS. So I'd say probably the okay. last, last two years, I was probably a bit of a nightmare with the team there because I started doing <laughs> these other brands and like she yeah. said, week and it turned into the week and, you know, oh, I need next week off and going abroad or whatever. And I get, I guess oh, I could get it from their angle. They could see it and they weren't going to do anything else. So I, I turned into, so, so I'd say probably like a two year window of building up to being full time and getting some regular clients. And even I did other things like it sounds like I just did that, but I, I did some restaurants, I did some hotels. And luckily I find, you know, places aren't as big as you think. Like Manchester, as soon as we started doing this couture club and it built, you know, it was building and doing well suddenly two young guys that are uh, friends with the owner own a massive restaurant in Manchester in the business district. So then I was doing the restaurant all of a sudden and then I had another restaurant off the back of that and it just kept rolling really, you know, where, and then I had an agency in Manchester wanting to work with me just as a cameraman and I'd never done that. So I was like, oh, I'll have a go. I, I don't really want to be just the camera. And I like directing and editing as well. But um, so I did some agency work, you know, just to see what those guys were doing. And then I kind of understood how an agency work, even on a smaller scale. And then when the JD stuff came in, I was like, well, I'm just shooting uh, predominantly fashion now. Like, you know, this is quite good. We're doing TV ads. We're, you know, we get paid really well. We're traveling. And, um, yeah, that's when I, I kind of decided, right, not on the show reels and stuff, not putting any hotels or restaurants in it. You know, we're, we're go to for fashion now. And that, that's kind of it. So, so that but John, was since, since that break with JD then, um, and to where we are now, how long yeah. ago was that? So JD Sports was probably, I think that was uh, 2018, I think that was. So, um, 1920, yeah, yeah, I'd say that was 2018. And then the thing is with JD Sports, for, for, for us and like a lot of people asking at the time, I think people thought like we had it made, that we're doing all this traveling and we're shooting, like we shot like Anthony Joshua, we shot Jaden Smith, and uh, like loads uh, of Amy and, and loads of stuff, but they work on a year contract. So like every year they change their creative. So it wouldn't matter if we'd like done amazing work for them or whatever it was, at the end of the year, they, they part ways with that production company or that photographer and they switch it up, which I understand because you know, they want whatever fresh talent and they've got endless budgets. So they just go chasing the next thing really. So it was really bizarre really that Steve, the, the guy that took us on just, saw us at some event where he was having some drinks and went, yeah, all right, you can do it for the year, you know? Okay, John, so if I get this right, so you 
educated background, creative content, then decided to get uh, a job uh, completely, obviously, away from what you started out with. And then you got your break uh, with the JD Sports. And actually, in a very short space of time, you've obviously worked with a lot of uh, you know very high-end brands. And we'll come on to a lot of them in more detail in a second. But the inevitable thing is you can't create this without having the right amount of kit. So um, tell us what's currently in your kit bag and yep. you know your collaboration with Zeiss as well as obviously Sony and, and explain that a little bit more to uh, the guys that are watching. Yeah, yeah, cool. Um, yeah, so so after I said uh, with the production awards, so I, I I suppose I'll jump back a little bit. So so when I was working for the NHS, they they worked all with um, Nikon gear, and um, at the time I bought just the DSLR, uh, which was that because we had endless lenses at. at the trust to, to borrow at the weekend or do stuff with and vintage ones as well so so I, I used some of those and then I won the Sony camera and then obviously I kind of just jumped ship to that because I was given lenses and I was given um, this fantastic camera and then so um, I traded off my uh, uh, DSLR that I had at the time for the Sony a6000 so that that was kind of my B cam after doing some research to, to the FS700 and um, I love that camera, it's amazing. Um, I'm sorry to see it go. I, I was shooting a lot of like landscape photography and time lapses at the time as well, just out of like, personal interest up at Snowdonia and stuff. And I was mixing some of that into the initial fashion work I started doing. So there was a lot more, until clients got heavily involved, a lot more kind of like na nice like landscape, natural elements and cutaways to the work, I thought. Um, and that was all done on the A6000, really. So I used that, and then from there, um, it's just that usual thing then, you know, where gear just gets a bit long in the tooth because releases happen and so on. So obviously, Sony started then doing the Alpha range, and I jumped ship on, I didn't get the A7S originally, I got the A7S II. So when that came out, and the A7 II, I think it was, I traded up my FS700 then for the A7S II because of the low light capability and I wanted to see what that was like. And um, an A7 II was like my stills camera. So I still had like two cameras and then if I did any corporate interviews or because I was still doing some work at the time for the NHS and stuff. So I was doing like interviews and, and stuff. So I'd set one camera up and it was maybe on a gimbal and the other on a tripod. Um, yeah, and they were really good. I was really impressed with the A7S II. Um, it was amazing. And the A7 II was really good for stills. And um, I must have used them again for about a year and a half, two years. And then I swapped that again. I got an A7 III. And crazily, with the JD projects, when we went into the first one, we didn't realize they were shooting for television. They never said that. It was all agreed that it was just social content. And, and we hadn't you know, like looked into being paid the additional fees for, for commercial on TV and such, because it was like prime time. But um, it ended up being that everything it was fine. We went through Clearcast, and we were shooting some TV ads on an A7 III, which is great because I don't think anyone at the time would dare do that, you know. Um, and then, yeah, from there, I've kind of then switched that up. So I've gone from an A7 III now to an A7S III, uh, which is fantastic. I really like that camera. Um, I've got an FS5 II at the moment. And I've gone from an FS5 to an FS5 II. Um, that's been really good. I've done a lot of handheld work and kind of I use it for a lot of like handheld cutaways and kind of um, slow shutter work and stuff. And obviously with the XLR inputs on that as well, it's it's really good uh, for interviews and stuff. And then, uh, yeah, obviously with these new releases as well, the FX6 and the FX3, they're kind of things I'm now looking at just to kind of keep updating, uh, you know, the kit. So from I suppose I'm talking about, you know, ambassador roles and endorsing and speaking. So I always try and keep up to date with stuff because if I'm speaking at events and talking about gear, I, I, you know, I guess it makes more sense to late to gear than not. And technology moves so fast now with, you know, 10 bit, 4K and 120 frames and stuff. And clients are getting more savvy with stuff. You know, everyone's got a mobile phone these days. So they kind of understand, you know, if it's if it looks really good or, you know, well, skin tones are good. And, all the rest of it. So, yeah, I'm currently looking at switching the cine camera up 
uh, but the A7S3 has been amazing so far. So, yeah. Okay, John, thanks for that. And um, so, for those of you that are watching that are not familiar with the Sony range, just to give you a very quick overview, uh, the model numbers that uh, John is talking about, the A7S series, is for our low light and uh, video uh, filmmaking. Uh, technology. So if you're looking to uh, use a, a camera within our range that's made for filmmaking, then the A7S series is, is uh, highly recommended. And we just last uh, year released the A7S Mark II, which John is using. And then we've mentioned the FS and the FX series. So this is our cinema line. This is the more pro cinematic uh, type of camera. And we've just literally in the last few days released the FX3, which kind of bridges the gap between uh, the stills alpha camera stroke video and the uh, uh, cinematic, uh, uh, more professional uh, filmmaking cameras. So that just gives you an idea. More information, you can visit obviously Wex's website and also our own um, sony.co.uk for more information. But uh, that just give you an idea of uh, where, where that sits. We mentioned that you've worked with uh, many, many brands and the Couture Club was one of those brands that you created content for. We're gonna play a reel now, it's just under a minute long. And then when we come back out again, Maybe we could talk about how did this come about? What's it like to work with models and crew? And, and also maybe, you know, what kind of personality and skills you need to, 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 to make this a success. success. So um, let's have a look at this yep. reel and we'll come back in a second. Obviously, we work with them for many years now, and um, it's, it's nice and straightforward with the team. Um, so for this one, we decided it was going to be in an old mill. Uh, we wanted like a large, uh, low lit space uh, that we were going to light. Uh, so that was left to to Jacob and myself really. And Jacob takes on a lot of the lights and stuff, uh, so he's the photographer. And uh, so we got in a large Arri light for that as like a key light I suppose and we kind of used it on flood so it kind of looked like it was daylight pouring in but really there wasn't any lights in the room at all oh uh, sorry window spaces um and then we added in a atmos uh you know like smoke machine and we just run that on low a lot of the time so it was kind of it just put a bit more depth in the shots and then we had two models we had a male and a female obviously as you can see in the video they did a lot of kind of like uh, intense workout stuff and um, we shot it like that uh, it wasn't meant to be too glamorized or kind of posy it's more you know people going for stuff lifting weights uh, pushing tires and uh, yeah even you know even if someone was doing yoga that they would be doing yoga they would just be in a pose so um, it was good it was it was nice to mix some fashion with some active wear really you know where you were getting that exciting like movement and uh, interaction between the two of them as well when they did some workouts together um, and then so team-wise for that, so there's Jacob, who's a photographer, there's myself doing the video, Hayley, who is uh, the creative lead at Couture, so she was just overseeing what was going on, and it was kind of her vision in the first place, you know, of what she wanted to do with the active wear launch. Uh, then we had a, well, he's a good mashup, so George is kind of like our runner assistant, and he does some BTS, so the BTS photos are, are via George, thanks for that. And uh, yeah, he also helped set up like, there's a large scrim to put the lights through just to diffuse them on the keys. And then the Arri light was kind of like a flood light and uh, we put that in the background. Um, and then I shot that on, that's on the A7S III with a gimbal. And for speed, because we were shooting stills and we were only doing eight hour day, um, myself and Jacob always kind of co-direct anyway. So he jump in and take some stills and then I jump in and do some video. And then that way it's nice and easy that we're both setting up scenes and bouncing ideas off each other. So, you know, if there's a particular point where you've done something and you're having a breather, then the other person's thinking what's next and, and you kind of just bounce off each other and you're not kind of, kind of 
trying to tread over each other for shots or to do better because you know you essentially work for the same team so it's, it's really nice and, and relaxed that way so when working with a crew and models and you know obviously pick from agencies and stuff like what what, what tips can yeah. you give to students then if they've got that opportunity uh, yeah. you know do, do, do you come up with that idea really really quickly or or does it evolve how, how, what, what can you advise uh, students on uh, when you know if they've got that opportunity to do that or they yeah. want to go out and, and you know have that yeah so so yeah so whether whether it's with an agency and, and they're coming up with a concept or they're asking you to do a pitch or a treatment um i suppose the differences there are so say you'd have a pitch which is you know that you're pitching an idea from the start of where it will be how it will look who will be involved how many models and so on or even shot whereas the treatment normally is the pitch is already there and you're coming up with what you do with it so so that's the difference of those um uh, with this one it's different again because we work regularly with couture uh we're like the go-to create for them so there's no stress whether we're getting the job or not we just know that we are but so we'd work directly with Haley, who is the creative lead so we'd just go in and have a meeting with Haley. And we'd sit around and have a coffee and she'd say, look, guys, you know, we're going to release activewear in a month. Uh, we want to shoot in a big open space. If you've got any ideas anywhere in Manchester, anything cool? Have you seen anything good? And then she'd bounce some ideas across the she's seen. We'd bounce some ideas back. And then we look at what budget we've got, you know, with how silly we can make it or how uh, sensible we have to be with rental and, and lighting and kit and, you know, runners and all the rest. And, yeah, so it, it just goes from there, really. And for the Club with this one, this was more like a middle of the road project, I suppose. You know, we're on lockdown. People want to do running and what they can to stay fit and active. So it was just a little line of clothing. It's not like their main seller. So they were going to put in a smaller budget for this, essentially. So we, we did as much as we could to kind of take it as high as we could, you know, like look wise and fashion wise. Yeah. And then I suppose, you know, talking about life on set as such, or, you know, like long working days um, on productions, I think. Um, Jacob and myself pride ourselves on that uh, we always try and keep everything light-hearted like we're super professional and, and get everything done you know we basically overshoot every job we do to make sure we've got enough content and the content uh, at least in our eyes perfect throughout you know that we're not shooting one scene and thinking, you know this isn't quite right or you know we write up shoot lists uh, we go and do recce's and uh, scouts for, for jobs um, you know, we know what we're doing on the day and we, we get it right. You know, like there's no kind of half measure, especially when there's a team there anyway, you know, people can see through things. So if you're doing half a job or you don't know what you're doing next, they're going to know that you're wasting their paid time on, you know, they've got models in or they've brought some of the, the owners in or whatever it may be. Like Ross, who owns the control club, is there on that active shoot. He wasn't shooting because he's a model himself. He's just stood around taking it all in. But we're old friends. You know, so that's fine. But you, you know, you're kind of aware of those things in the back of your mind still. So, um, yeah. So just keeping it lighthearted, you know. And the same in the models. You know, I've I've learned from days of old of pushing people too much in the cold and the wet and stuff like that. That if you can take regular breaks and keep people happy and make them feel valued and like they're having a good time, you'll get much better results off them than if people are annoyed or feel like you're asking too much of them or putting them through something they don't want to do. You know. Um, recently we did a project and I knew it was going to be cold the wrong time of year to be shooting in woods and we brought in two models that we've worked with a couple of times before that I know were kind of hard as nails off sets you know they they hiked up an hour to a cave to shoot underground and all the rest of it so I knew that they would do anything we'd ask them and they value our work as well and vice versa you know so it's just a good relationship uh, and I so I suppose, I suppose you've you've got to be you know you've got to have a certain amount of skills and abilities here to people skills I'm talking about here to to ensure yeah. your team are you know still motivated to work for you yeah. or with you and and to create this content. A hundred percent, and and even just little things that I've I've kind of learned over the years of like if you're working with someone new you haven't worked with before without kind of um, seem cringy about it if you can slip them some of your work or a project you've done just so they can see what they're getting involved in and that will kind of you know heighten them as well that they'll think oh actually yeah this isn't just you know a quick lookbook or uh, a fashion video i'm not going to post on my own account you know if it's a model or something that it's something that they want to be involved in and they they know there's going to be a good result from so you know any any way that you can keep people's 
spirits high and, and want to shoot through the day and you know do a full eight or 14 hours or whatever it is um that's that's great and that's that's one thing i've noticed it's much harder these days to say influences that they're, they're kind of their own people and that's awkward you know they don't come from a model agency you know the dealing direct or the brands dealing direct and because they've got their own amount of following and their own uh, how do you describe you know they kind of see themselves as this celebrity type character um i've definitely seen some divas in the last couple of years with that you know not, <laughs> not wanting to shoot not wanting to do much oh i take my photos like this which is funny because those photos that they're talking about are on a phone they're not even on a professional camera uh, and so on and so on so yeah it's it's a minefield these days of you know who you'll be working with so i just think you know if you can always be professional but have fun at the same time then it's it's the best way to go Brilliant. Great advice. Thanks, John. Again, a really good insight to creating content for, for brands. So we're going to have a look at a new music video that you've put together. Uh, it's just around two minutes long. It's worth watching because you're using a lot of technology out of our cameras to create uh, you know, some fantastic content. But I'm also interested in how much planning goes into something like this. And also, as a viewer, how, how do you get me into that? How do you influence me? How do you, how do you, you know, get, you know, get, get me interested in in what you're uh, creating. And uh, let's play the reel and we'll come back and uh, ask you some more questions. So with the Heart of Gold piece, um, it was like our first music video as such, um, and it was nice. So um, Mike is the, the singer or the artist, Heart of Gold, and uh, he's in a massive rock band separately to that. So it's like a side project. Um, he's back over from LA at the moment, um, living back here with his parents, just to uh, kind of see everyone, because he's normally over there. But obviously with uh, COVID and everything, he can't play at the moment. So, um, yeah, he spun us a job and it's kind of a nice opener that's like just an interlude piece of the album. Um, it's not a big single or anything. So we wanted to do something kind of like dreamscape, um, you know, walking through um, rural open roads. Uh, we knew the snow was predicted. Uh, we did this just before Christmas. And as soon as it dropped, we were up there the next morning, um, super early, uh, blue hour. And it was interesting, we got up there and um, there was no sunlight, but it was very, very overcast and the, the, the sky was just full of snow. You could just tell it was very, very cold and no one had been up there. So um, we got to shooting and we talked about shooting it all in slow motion. Uh, we wanted it kind of very slow pace, slow burning kind of thing. And um, that really tested the camera as well. So with the A7S III, I shot all that in 4K, 120 frames. And obviously to shoot 120 frames with the shutter high enough, um, we had to lean on the new ISO setting of uh, 12,800, which is great. So, so we used that, shot it like, I think it was like f2.8 or something uh, with Mike. And um, yeah, it just went really, really well. Like the, the footage is really clean. It, it's crazy considering how high the ISO is. Um, it was my first time as well, in all honesty, of working with proxies. I, I've never really bothered. I like having a fast workflow. And uh, I'm now working with them all the time. Uh, that made me realise those, those work really well. And uh, yeah, just I was really happy with the result. Mike was really happy. And um, it was one of those where it was left up to us. So, you know, Mike wanted this, he had this rough idea of just be walking. And he originally wanted to do it through our town. And I was like, oh, it'd be okay. But, you know, there's a lot of branding, a lot of logos. It's quite a cluttered image. 
and I'd been road biking over those those country roads. So I just thought, oh, these these will work really well. So we just went for a scout in advance, and Mike checked us out, and he was happy enough. And uh, off it went, really. That that we just went up. We did one morning shoot with that, and got freezing cold. We got the car stuck in snow and all kinds of stuff. It was quite fun. <laughs> I, I just had a friend driving the car, and then uh, from there uh, we went up again, and we did uh, Golden Hour instead. So uh, I think on that one, I lent upon uh, my father to drive the car, and we went and shot Mike walking through a load of woods, and then I jumped in the boot of the car for like pull away shots and Mike would walk down the road and the car would slowly ease away from him and obviously with like the amazing continual focus now it just stayed on him throughout uh and yeah so it sounds like a lot of planning go a lot of planning goes into this john you know I, I, yeah, it, even the un, even the unknown where the weather changes and you've got a lot yes, of things yeah, going on yeah definitely you know that you've got even just silly things like food supplies you've got somewhere access to go to the, the toilets or something and then it's obviously as well like dealing with the snow and having, I haven't got a four by four, just got a regular car. So dragging everyone up there, making sure everyone's safe and happy enough to be doing so. Uh, so yeah, scouting obviously is a big one. So it's so all the pre-planning of that with Mike and then just making sure everyone's willing to get up on time, you know, to do blue hour and golden hour and how much extra that will add to something, you know, rather than shoot say middle of the day, like a lot of production teams in LA and stuff just won't even shoot in the middle of the day because the sun's so high and the shadows are so harsh. Um, it's just not a good look. So yeah, it, it worked really well. Just splitting the day into two separate shoots essentially and then having the time to review what we've done so far. Um, yeah, worked really well. So as well as planning, John, I'm starting to see a little bit of a, a kind of John Edwards stroke naive studios style starting to appear in this content, uh, which is great. I, I, you know, I love it. Is there much post editing going on? And if there is, what kind of, you know, um, technology uh, software you're using? Are you doing it or do you ex uh, source it externally? Uh, you know, obviously, if you can afford to, to do that or, or you prefer to do that. Yeah, so with that, um, yeah, I kind of, I've handed projects off before for editing or if I'm busy and I take on a smaller project that I'm not so keen on, um, you know, whether it's a regular client and you're just trying to keep them happy or whether it's a new client and they just want, say, a behind the scenes thing or something to start with, then I'll hand it off to a junior or something to edit. But yeah, so I kind of, normally with any project, I kind of pride myself on and I like doing everything. I just like being involved. So um, from color grading to, to editing to effects to sound building and you know sound design um, across the board really doing everything. So um, yeah, like like with that one, kind of the whole lot. You know, from working with the proxies to S Log three, which I, I love. I always shoot everything in S Log three. Um, I know days of old people used to say S Log two in the earlier Alpha cameras, but I've always shot S Log three because of the FS seven hundred. So uh, I just John, love John can you explain as well a couple of bits of jargon there for those maybe not aware proxies Hi. and s log three oh, yeah. um yeah, yeah. sony fied we we kind of know but um be good yeah, to, and, and course. maybe why we why you use that yeah so yeah so proxies are kind of new to me but essentially it, it means that they from what I, i've read up on it that the files are so big at the camera well not not necessarily big they're packaged i suppose so so they're not huge file sizes but for the computer to play them, it's um, kind of a lot of work for it. So, so essentially, now in Final Cut, Premiere, uh, Resolve, any of the editing software you're using, you can take in the clips and then ask the software to basically um, modify the clip and play it at, say, half the quality or 50% size of the file. Which is great because obviously if you're shooting a 4K file and then you're just presenting the project to someone in HD, say, um, I normally shoot 4K anyway, but then I can half the file size whilst editing in Final Cut and it'll play nice and smooth uh, for me to review stuff. And then I can export it still in HD, but obviously it's reading it off a 4K file. So when you actually export it, you're like, wow, as much as this is HD, it looks super nice. Um, Obviously, you can you can set up a 4K timeline, but at the moment, you know, less people are asking for that. So then, even when you're supplying device format stuff for your phone or Instagram, the quality looks, you know, insanely good uh, via working with proxies and 4K files. So um, yeah, it's, it's definitely worth doing. And you know, cameras across the board now. I know 
um, the A6000 range and stuff as well, you, you can shoot in 4K. Yeah, I'd say it's worth it. Or even again, for punch-ins on interviews, you know, you, if it's um, four times the size and you're running HD, you know you've got, you can zoom in like massively into that file to almost like split two angles, even though you've shot one. So, and, uh, and of course yeah. you retain all the detail as well, which is, and yeah. correct yeah. stabilization if you're shooting uh, yeah. 4K, which obviously, you know, I think also I've tried it before where you could um, recreate a kind of slider effect but not actually yes, use a slider, image. which which yeah, yeah. yeah, which is quite you know if you're using that greater data. Um, we talk talk briefly about S Log three, and uh, which leads me into kind of that style I'm starting to see. What is the style? You know, what is what is Nine yeah. Studios style? And S Log obviously using for grading and put, pushing that. more dynamic range. So, um, give us yeah. an idea of that and how, how obviously that can you know advice for workflow for for students that are watching. Yeah, yeah. So, so I find with, with S-Log3, with um, Sony Cine cameras, I find normally you kind of um, underexpose one stop. And with, say, the Alpha cameras, I find more so that you overexpose one stop with S-Log. Um, and that just means that you're saving a lot of the highlight details and you're getting a lot of details in the mids and the shadows. And obviously, with it being log, um, that's like a flat color profile. So rather than, say, shooting something and the color out of the box being crisp and punchy and kind of like say a tv report or something you know like a news report uh, you're getting a much flatter image so it's something you can work with a bit like the raw photograph so you can pull it and move it and twist it and get a lot more back so you know you can save all the clouds in the sky and you can still maybe see into that cave and see there's someone actually stood in the shadows there uh, it just means rather than say shooting and making sure black is black, you can't really do anything with that afterwards. Whereas if you're shooting log, you know, you've got that flexibility to change the image and there's more dynamic range within the image. And uh, yeah, and I, I've, I've always shot like that from what I was trained. So it's always helped really where people now say uh, cinematic and, you know, like making anything and everything look cinematic. But you like, but it honestly is if you shoot log because that. And I suppose that's another great point. I was actually talked to someone the other day about this. Is um, I won't name brands or you know try and name shame or whatever. But but a lot of the other brands don't make cinema cameras. So when they say, "Oh, we do such and such a brand log," and we do such and such a brand log, you're like, "Yeah, you kind of do, but you don't actually." No one in Hollywood picks up your camera and shoots a you know a million multi million pound movie on it so so that log is not actually used in cinema whereas you know sony's had the f65 now it's had the venice and you know s log uh is being used across the board for that so so it is an actual cinema look you know like it's actually seen in the cinema where some of the others aren't and that was my argument with a friend the other day who was summoning an hour and about buying a different camera and he was saying about the color out of cameras and i was like well you know like Sony's got that back in that it does shoot cinema. That's the difference. So we've got another reel now, John. It's uh, of two brands working together. So it's Hype and Lego. And once we play that reel, we're going to play the behind the scenes. You're going to talk over that and give us a good idea of what it was like to, to create this and uh, talk about the behind the scenes. And we'll come back with a, a few more questions as well. <laughs> So that was the real John. Um, I'm going to play the behind the scenes now. So perhaps you can talk us through the behind the scenes of creating this content uh, for the students that are watching. Yeah, so with the behind the scenes and the video itself, um, we shot it in a container yard, uh, as you can see in this behind the scenes. And um, yeah, we shot from about 5 p.m. to about 2 a.m. Uh, we had a light team in, as you can see there, and some motocross bikes, uh, two models, 
and it was uh, Lego Ninjago, so obviously a slightly different uh, range for Lego. And then the container units were a nod to the Lego bricks, essentially, because obviously we were trying to modernise this, and it's more towards teens and young adults rather than young children for Lego. Uh, but Hype do a lot of collaborations. I normally come in on their collaborations and their main campaigns. I don't do the smaller uh, production side of things. They've got an in-house guy for that. And um, yeah, as you can see there, we were reviewing through some footage, directing the motocross guys, um, directing the lighting guys, and working with Joe Docker, who's kind of the lead at Hype. Uh, Joe's really cool, he takes all the photos. Um, yeah, it's very cold, hard to get through, lots of stuff like mist on cameras, and uh, uh, it was very wet and damp. I can remember jumping in cars and trying to like defog everything and get warm again and go again. It's very uh, tasking and hard to do, but um, yeah, great shoot, um, great results. We worked with um, Ezra Cohen as well from the US, who does all the effects. Uh, used one of his packs, and he was so happy with it. He put it on his site as like the main feature of, of those packs, and he's just been on like Forbes and stuff. So that was kind of cool as well. That yeah, John, it was it really well. You know, every, John, everyone that's watching is obviously thinking, how, how do these jobs come up? You know, how you know is it luck? Is it is it you know is it yeah, or is it purely stuff. hard? You know, you've worked hard at your career. Is it is, is this you know how? What can we you know advise students that are watching yeah. that? Yeah. How do, how so, do we so, get something like this? It's awesome. Yeah. So even like little pockets. So Hype only came about because Joe, that I mentioned that's the photographer and the creative lead for Hype, uh, used to ride BMX as well, the same as I did. And we kind of rode in similar kind of brackets. I never knew Joe. And then uh, just via online, via social media, he'd seen the video work I was doing because it was fashion and kind of, you know, northwest, the Midlands kind of area. And, uh, and then I'd seen that he was photographer for Hype and we just got talking. And then he was like, oh, you know, do you want to come in and do the main campaigns? I, I'm in control of that. I can sort that out. What are your rates and stuff? And, uh, yeah, we had to flex a little bit on rates, uh, which is funny, you know, because, like, you, you'd think with something like this, we're like, we've done now for Hype. We've done Disney. We've done Lego. Uh, uh, we've done Universal Pictures twice. Uh, we've done some big collaborations with them. And they get signed off by the brand, so it's not like Disney's not seeing it or Universal's not signing off. They are. Uh, but I had to reduce rates a little bit for it, you know, so it's just, it's one of those things where if you're willing to flex or, you know, kind of to be seen to be doing the right things, I feel, uh, I'm more than happy, you know, to, to keep Joe and the team happy there, to be doing cooler projects or at least what, you know, where we're getting bigger budgets in off the collaboration companies and we're getting the light team in or we're getting a better location or longer hours to shoot and stuff. So I've, I guess it's just one of those where, it's just always putting in the time and effort, you know, and wanting to make it as good as you possibly can, rather than for just settling for something. You mentioned social media earlier, and I mean, clearly it plays a, a, an important role in, in advertising and getting the message across. You've adapted this to um, social as well, so I'm just going to play this clip now, and maybe you can talk over it about, um, you know, how important is social media to you when, when you are advertising? So uh, let's just play this real. Yeah, so predominantly we use uh, Instagram, and I suppose I've kind of grown up with when I was still working for the hospital, where I was kind of uh, the NHS, I was I was still posting a lot then on the account, and I kind of turned it from a personal account to a business account, the naive, and. Um, yeah, from then really, I kind of noticed how it was going. Like, um, I got the endorsement and the ambassador role with Zeiss, and obviously I had some affiliation with Sony at the time. So I was posting stuff and tagging them in, and they were reposting stuff. And then I was watching the numbers go up because now, whenever I talk to like an agency or something, they're like, "Oh, you've got a lot of followers," because a lot of directors and stuff just don't have a lot of followers. Um, but I feel just because we've kind of grown up in that market of social and understanding the worth of it. I've always kind of done as much of it as I can between being busy with, you know, the actual shoots and, and the work itself. So, um, yeah, from making, as you just shown them, Mark, the, the verticals um, to obviously now people on square format, uh, that new, like, I think it's like a four or five, which is like semi, semi vertical for the wall because it's the biggest space you can play. Um, I didn't know, honestly, I kind of hate those formats because they kind of, <laughs> I shoot, you know, I like shooting wide. I like yeah. shooting like, it looks like cinema. 
and then you know turning a professional project into the shape of a phone just seems ridiculous yeah. but, you know, but you know that's well, the way the market's gone so but yes and it um, is a form of advertising so I, I suppose again students that are watching what kind of tips can you give them when it comes to marketing their their yeah. content you know if, if there are three key uh, kind of you know pieces of advice yeah. what would you take into consideration uh, when you, yeah. you may be starting out or or you you know you you've got the content you just don't know how to promote it yeah yeah so so currently we do we do some paid social ads i normally put around 50 pounds down on each video i put out and then put that out as like a weekly advert and then i just change up the demographic and age group on who i want to see that you know so obviously for us it's more like people in their 30s that run agencies or, or you know run brands and stuff uh and like major cities but um yeah i'd say you know shoot lots of content shoot behind the scenes content of yourself you know even if you can get a partner um, a friend a colleague whatever with when you're shooting projects people love to see how people are shooting stuff you know at any level don't don't think because you know you're, you're shooting a uni project or you're shooting you know a personal project people want to see that i find a lot of time uh, I've kind of shied away now from shooting so many landscapes, so I just haven't got the time. But I'd always be a bit disheartened normally when I'd shoot like a landscape I was really happy with. And if, say, a friend had just took like a, a quick picture over the shoulder or something, I'd normally get more likes or more questions than the actual final result of the image that I put all the time and effort into. So, uh, yeah, people love to, you know, be nosy, I guess, on social. So that, that works really well. So that's one thing. Paid advertising is good. You know, if you want to turn it into a business and then do paid ads like verticals and wides, uh, they work. And then also things like Vimeo and YouTube are great again, you know, for networking. Um, I kind of look back on it now and wish I'd done more with YouTube. I used to find it quite laughable and quite like, uh, how do you describe, just people kind of going hard and writing nasty comments and, you know, it being a bit idiotic. But, uh, but obviously it's grown legs massively since then and people have full on channels now and earn a lot of money off it. Uh, I'd always put more time and effort into Vimeo and that community, and I do a lot of that stuff. But um, yeah, those, those two platforms again, great for you know showcasing work, trying to get staff picks on Vimeo, uh, getting followers on YouTube, and doing you know ad revenue and stuff. You know, you can earn a lot of money as well. So they're, they're probably good ways of, of getting out there. Thanks, John. And we're going to finally finish on this last piece of content with a couple of questions as well. So before we hand over to Wex and yourself, because you're going to be at the end of this webinar, you're going to be answering questions live whilst the, when this finishes. Uh, we're going to have a look at this reel. You've been working with a band in L.A. It's some fantastic content that really shows off a lot of our technology as well. And I've got three final questions to ask you before we hand you over to Wex. So let's have a look at this. content John and look it's been really challenging for all of us in the last year regarding the global pandemic but you have continued to generate some fantastic content so how have you been able to motivate yourself in these you know really tricky times and yeah. um, you know how, how tough has it been yes yeah, it's, it's been really hard so so like end of last year um, the whole spring summer campaign season just went down the drain so uh, like I, I did a month of like organizing everything trip to la again probably three weeks shoot straight about six to eight different brands and just all completely off the plate because obviously no travel uh, no garment samples from china everything, everything just disappeared uh, and obviously the worry of what was going on because no one knew at the time it was just so fresh and new um, 
just trying not to stress out really you know it was just kind of everyone was going through the motions and didn't know what to do i've got other friends with production companies and you know ringing me up stressed out or oh, i've lost another client at the moment they don't want to spend any money this has been shut down and i was like well you know we just everyone's the same like don't worry like hopefully you know you get government help and you just you know you just roll with it and see what happens so i kind of turned into just an editor for a little bit um spring summer kind of time i ended up doing a big property company in london just doing all like re-edits they'd had some stuff shot they weren't happy with it so i just recut all this content from it was just really weird it was all cgi stuff as well it wasn't even real um uh, yeah so, so that that just dropped by chance really you know got me through that period and then the government started handing out the grants and stuff so that helped and then um uh, yeah come by like september and stuff you know people were shooting again so we started doing campaigns and luckily for the fashion sector anyway, everyone's sales have just boosted online, you know, especially if they're doing loungewear or active wear and stuff. So that helped massively. And we went just right back into projects until the next lockdown, really. So so we just kind of, you know, within like safety measures and reading procedures and stuff, um, got back on the stuff and then uh, found again now like January's just been crazy this year because uh, people haven't spent the money from the back end of last year and they're coming up for their end of working year. So they want to get rid of their budgets. So it's been a godsend that as much as we lost at the beginning of last year, kind of the end of, well, sorry, no, now the beginning of this year, but the end of the financial year as such, uh, people are throwing money around again. So that's, yeah, that's, that's been good, less stressful. Well, thank you for sharing that with us, John. I mean, really do appreciate it because it's, you know, it's been tough for, for everybody in, in different yeah. ways. And um, I think with recent announcements, uh, it gives us a little bit of hope that we can get back to normal. So when you do get back to normal, yeah. Okay. When we are, you know, you're at your best, you're at your brightest. Um, you know, what yeah. what do you enjoy the most about what you um, do? That's the best bit. What's yeah. the worst thing, I suppose? But, you know, what yeah, are the challenges the when you get back when you get back to normal? <laughs> yeah. So uh, straight off, really, I was actually talking to Jacob today because we kind, you know, we kind of worked together and everything. And I was saying, oh, as things are opening up, we need to get back on because we did all those pitches for like last February, March time to do. Uh, what would that be? SS20. Uh, we can bring it back again this year, really. It's not all lost. And uh, even if it's a bit late, that we could maybe uh, look at a two to three week trip, you know, and uh, reel in brands by saying, look, we're away anyway, wherever we're going to be. Uh, we could shoot for you at just our rate. You know, there's no additional cost to the location. You know, we just need the models in, off you guys, and off it goes. So we're looking again, probably as soon as we can going back to the I love the desert and I know Jacob does as well and all the little crazy towns and all the weirdness of it so we're going to try and go back to Death Valley and around that area Palm Springs and stuff and kind of yeah just um, shoot a bunch of projects because neither of us have uh, we're not very good at chilling so uh, <laughs> just working working somewhere that we love is, is kind of our holiday you know like so we'll go away and do that and then uh, yeah, so that's well, the don't, work, don't work too don't work too hard because we'd like to do some physical workshops with you with uh, yeah. companies like Wex and the B two B team and stuff yeah. like that. Yeah. So uh, it That'd may be all be virtually now, but um, for those of you watching, the aim in the future is to be able to engage with uh, student community at different universities uh, with uh, content creators like John to uh, test kit and find out more about uh, how. Uh, content creators like John uh, operate and so on. So uh, we look forward to that in the future. Um, yeah. Finally, John, final question. Um, students that are watching, what would be your your, your key kind of tips uh, to get into filmmaking? Thank you for sharing what you've done so far. And I know there'll yeah. be lots of questions uh, at the end of this uh, from people that are watching as well. So, you know, yeah. give us, in, a, in a, just in the next couple of minutes, your final yeah. tips uh, yeah, for yeah. Get, you know, a career in a filmmaking. Yeah, so, so I'd say, Firstly, kind of, you know, developing a style or an idea of, of what you want to do and how you want to do it. You know, so maybe you draw influences from something. Like, I, I kind of grew up on BMX videos without me even realising, you know, that I was watching all those edits and, and how those were put together, you know, as much as it was probably by uh, some kid in America in his 20s or whatever, just filming BMX and was completely unaware. But I kind of hung off those videos so much, it was my whole kind of youth that, you know, I didn't realize how much I was watching video editing, I suppose, and, and kind of like, you know, listening to music and looking at, you know, like different kind of pockets of uh, culture, I suppose, in a way. And, and, you know, something like BMX or skateboarding 
so so just taking something that you love and putting that into it a little bit i think and then developing a star with it as well i i always really liked 80s horror films because there was no gore in them you know it's all just in your mind so again now i kind of always try and bring that in that everything's just a visual story uh, you know and how quick you can tell a story within a minute or 30 seconds now or whatever it may be for social even that it's not just a lookbook you know normally there's a bit more woven into it or an idea that people can tag onto uh, or you know leave it into, like open to interpretation so just develop them that way and then um, yeah i think just getting gear and shooting you know just getting whatever you can afford at the time um I, I always think it's kind of crazy that people get too hung up on gear. I remember one guy kept messaging me and saying, I'm going to buy a red camera, I'm going to buy a red camera. And I was like, but I don't understand what you need a red camera for, you know? Like, it's a, it's a very expensive piece of kit. And from what I can see that he's posting, he's not shooting a lot commercially, he's just getting into it. And I'm like, it's too big an investment for what you're doing. You're not going to see the return on it, you know? It's just silly. Um, it's not going to suddenly make you work fantastic or get you employed loads because the employer's not going to know what that is. Um, so yeah, just just kind of you know being, being realistic, budgeting, buying good gear, you know, upgrading gear because obviously stuff changes so often and it's so good now. But yeah, just just find something that you can afford to buy or you know looking at um, what you've got booked and um, yeah, working working with what you've got essentially. <coughs> sorry man and then um yeah lastly um i'd say yeah just having a social presence these days is really good you know put some time and effort into that it doesn't have to be anything cringe or you know loads of blogging or whatever like if you don't want to be on camera you don't have to but just regular posts uh behind the scenes content if you don't want to talk you know you can get someone to just shoot some photos whether you know it's a partner or a friend and just showing what you're doing uh showing kit as well that you're using. You know, people are always interested, you know, if, even if it's a, a lower grade camera that you bought to start out with, there's lots of people in that bracket learning that. So if you're doing something good with it, you know, that excites someone else and so on. So um, yeah, yeah, just being involved and, you know, reaching out to people and talking to people. I talk to people all the time that I kind of always feel embarrassed by now. It's like, you know, a fully grown adult where I'm talking to some guy who shot a Jaguar commercial or whatever, but. I want to ask him something, so I just do. And then a lot of time, you know, you, you'll actually bounce off each other and talk back a little bit and you kind of, you know, develop a relationship and have some like weird internet friend that you talk to now and then. So, I, you know, everyone's reachable these days. And I think that's a really cool thing about social, you know, if used right. A good way to end as well, John. So um, I'm just going to bring up your website as well. And for further information on John's work, and who he is and what he does and how to contact him uh, at the bottom of the screen here you see that we have yep. uh, john's website and uh, i know you're active on social and you can find out your social channels on here as well so uh, all i can say at this stage john is thank you ever so much for your time and yep. putting this together and uh sharing your stories and your journey and tips for how to get into career uh, how to get a career in filmmaking and um we're now going to hand you over to the guys at Wex and John will be in the comments section uh, available now to answer your questions. And uh, thank you for joining us. Thank you to the Wex team for hosting this. And uh, we'll see you again uh, in the next few months with another Wex B2B uh, webinar uh, on their social channels. All the best. Oh, cool. thank you for that, John. That was really interesting. And thank you, obviously, thank you to Mark as well for helping us put that together. So we are live for a little bit of a Q&A afterwards. So please chuck your questions in um, and have a bit of a chat. So I think to kick things off, obviously, you mentioned your showreels and things like that. I guess top tips for students for putting together a showreel. Is there like a length of time, you'd say, kind of to have it last or keep it under a certain length? Basically, your top tips for putting that together. Yeah, I'd, I'd say... Um... Yeah, under, under a minute normally, ideally. I mean, unless you're kind of doing more like branded doc or, you know, like different styles of work, but for say fashion, online adverts and, and social content, uh, if you're kind of going towards that, our, our reels are normally under a minute on purpose, uh, around the minute mark, um, you know, if you shot a lot of projects throughout the year, just so you can kind of show a fair amount of uh, key clips from each, each project and kind of, you know, really kind of want to hit home with your, your style. 
uh, you know, and, and the feel of the work really from the color grade to, to the cuts, uh, to the transitions and even down to the graphics, uh, you know, all elements of it really. Um, but yeah, I think they're important. We use them as a CV, you know, essentially that we send out to companies and agencies to get work. So um, yeah, definitely something to focus on. And even, even if you're starting out and like people have asked in the comments, if you haven't got clients, you know, you can uh, shoot a couple of personal projects and develop a reel off it. Or I know some people do directly shoot for a reel, but I've seen that criticized a little bit as well, just because it's kind of, you know, you're doing single shots to develop a reel rather than creating an actual film, which I, I 60, 40 on that, you know, where I think that's a little unfair. If you haven't got clients yet, then, you know, you're going to have to create some content and maybe you haven't got the budget to see through, you know, full, full films or full projects with people. Um, mm. But I've, I've been through that myself where I think someone asked earlier about, you know, how would you shoot things if you don't have a budget or a client and just, uh, you know, being polite with friends or, or finding suitable fill-ins. Um, I've got a couple of mates I used to have as models occasionally um, and I worked with them and I kind of knew that they'd see the project through and help me out. Um, so yeah, pulling in favors or, you know, even working for free. I think there was a brand we worked for for like two, two years maybe. And we shot all their content for free just because I was a fan of the brand and I wanted to work with them and they didn't have the budget so much at the time to, to give us anything, but I just wanted to do it. So we saw that through and, and luckily now we're, we're producing work from that we're super proud of and we're putting into film festivals and they're paying us. So it's just worked out in the, you know, the long game, I suppose. We've had quite a few questions as well about where you find your inspiration. I was wondering if you could kind of delve into that a little bit more. You mentioned a couple of filmmakers that you kind of okay, inspire yeah. you as well. So yeah, just kind of where you look for filmmakers, yeah. is it places like Vimeo or Instagram, yeah, yeah. just kind of yeah. that sort of thing? Um, yeah, definitely Vimeo. So, you know, the, the community there is great. And I feel like it's so different compared to say the, the YouTube channels. Like I've got, we've got a couple of juniors that work for us uh, and they cut a lot of stuff and shoot a lot of stuff and, and they're really cool. But I find with them being maybe 10 years younger than myself, they're really into like YouTube and all the filmmakers on there, uh, which I find more like, they're not like cinema photographers or commercial directors. They're more like YouTube stars in their own right, in a way. They're kind of like their own brand. And I don't know, to me personally, I'm not so interested in that. Like I've done a bit of like going away on holidays and stuff and, and shooting them and, and putting those out. And that helped me get on Zeiss and do stuff with Sony originally. But um, I'm not really the whole like kind of explorer filmmaker kind of bracket, you know, like I'm a bit too old for that now with having kids and so on. So um, I like Vimeo and I like kind of the professional side of that, you know, where it's kind of, uh, people working for agencies and big brands and you know making shorts and even I've seen some of the commercial directors recently starting to move towards movies which is really interesting you know just to see how they're going about that you know how they've ended up as like they're shooting a Hollywood movie rather than you know a, a two-minute commercial spot for Audi or something so so that's super interesting so yeah Vimeo I suppose and then obviously Instagram's great because all the agencies put out all the recent work and they tag in the directors and that's easy to find people. And as I said before in the talk, you know, I, I reach out to people all the time and just be cheeky and it's, it's really good, you know, like just send them a message, ask them something about a project or comment about something. And a lot of time, you know, they're, they're great and you can strike up conversations with people and, and learn a lot from them. So, yeah. Cool. And I guess before we finish, any parting tips for students currently in education? What would be your top tip for those guys just kind of in their kind of starting out or just about to finish? Yeah, yeah. Uh, so in, in like a university bracket or a college or, or kind of... Either, yeah, I guess. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah, I think, as I said before, just don't worry too much about kit. You know, if, you, if you're good at shooting and, and you can shoot stuff, you don't need an amazing camera. You know, you can shoot on a phone. You can shoot on, as we said before, like the, the Sony uh, A6000 range. There's, there's about three or four different models in there now. Mm -hmm. I had the original A6000 as a B cam. Uh, to the FS700 that was a, a 10 grand camera at the time and that and that small camera was the the B cam and was running clips alongside it but if it's color graded and shot right you can't really tell what's what you know like as long as it looks good then um, it's fine so uh, yeah I just wouldn't stress about gear too much you know just get into it and start shooting projects uh, lean upon friends you know offer your work out to, to agencies and brands and stuff you know just be cheeky and see what you can get i got a friend who works in LA and he's, he works for some massive companies like Adidas and Foot Locker and stuff but 
he's he always makes me laugh because I speak to him and he's so American. He's always like, oh, I'm hustling, bro, and all this kind of stuff. But it's really cool, you know. Like he he that's just how he gets work, and and I think that's how most people get work. You know, unless you're on a big agency and you're signed, uh, and they come to you with projects. Um, I'm still always chasing clients and and new things. Um, I, I kind of like it that way, you know. It's kind of exciting rather than just knowing what you're doing or having a retainer. So. Mm. Yeah. fantastic well thank you so much again for, for taking the time to kind of go through everything with us today it's been really good um thank you to yeah. everyone who has joined us and i hope everyone has a really nice afternoon and yeah. weekend yeah Happy thanks problem. again thank you. Yeah. <laughs> thanks a lot thanks